Okay, so what we want to do uh, right now is talk about what we learned um, in the, um, uh, in the uh, 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 second part of that questionnaire I talked about, about uh, what uh, works and what doesn't. Um, this is Mabel. She was uh, a puppy mill rescue, uh, and uh, she had all kinds of mammary tumors, and her eyes uh, both blinded by glaucoma and... Uh, it's just such a typical uh, sad story, but she was adopted by a real nice lady, and uh, um, she's done quite well. So again, this is the second part of the study where uh, we, we looked more into what uh, uh, applied to uh, specifically to puppy mill dogs, and this is the question um, that gets to uh, the help in treatment, and that is, of all the things you've done to help your dog overcome any difficulties he or she was showing upon arrival to your household, what do you feel was the most helpful or effective? And I took all the comments. Uh, this is uh, 675 dogs um, that uh, are uh, the owners of these dogs that responded to the questions. And I went through lengthy essay um, uh, answers that they had written. Um, uh, when people write about their rescue dogs, they're not shy about writing pages and pages. Um, so uh, it's a lot of reading, but um, it's, needless to say, very informative. So I picked out the things that, that showed up most and least, um, and we're going to talk about them right now. Uh, this is um, from the most common uh, uh, recommendations or, or uh, things that worked to the least. And what I want to do is just with each of these, um, give you some of the specific comments that people made, and it'll give you really a good oversight of... Um, of each of these um, things that they found so helpful. The first is patience. And what we found, uh, um, or, or the comments I should mention, um, are these. Uh, lots and lots of patience, allowing her to progress at her own pace. We don't push her to do anything she doesn't want to do. No pressure. Give her as much time as it takes. Nothing has helped her except patience and time. The most important thing my husband and I did was to let Skippy come to us on his own terms. We desperately wanted to hug and kiss and hold Skippy as soon as we picked him up from the airport, but we saw that we would have scared him senseless. The only way Skippy could ever learn to trust us and any other human was to take his time and come to us when he was ready. Being patient, but encouraging him to participate in the family. Now, that last comment sounds like all the others, but it's not. And this is where it gets a little complicated, and you'll see what I mean as we go along. But when you talk about being patient but encouraging, what do you mean by encouraging? Because as we will see with these dogs, many of them are not wanting. In fact, that's why it's considered the most effective thing, is they don't want to be pushed because they're not used to it, and it's very, um, uh, uh, well, psychologically harmful to them, uh, at least in their own mind. So the encouraging thing gets a little complicated, but um, we're going to sort through that uh, all as we go out. Now, I should point out that um, when you want to give recommendations to people about what works best with these puppy mill dogs, realize that being patient isn't really doing anything. Um, it's not what the person is going to do. It's an attitude the person takes. So the number one by far thing that people find helpful is this and that is having another dog. Um, having other dogs in the house, they helped her more than we ever could. Having our first dog show Popeye the ropes, he watches the other dogs intently and has learned many behaviors from them. Other dogs that make him feel comfortable. Other dogs, she was always watching them and doing what they did. Having our other dogs to show her we were okay. My dog showed her how to be a dog. Bringing in a puppy, we had Nikki for years before Brandy the puppy came home. Once Brandy was there, from eight weeks onward, boy, did Nikki come out of his shell. The best thing I ever do, did was to get another dog. Now, that last comment is also a little different than the others because there's, an, there, there's the situation of adopting these dogs into households where their dogs already are. This last comment is about adding a dog to now, they're both kind of similar. It's not like they're vastly different, but both scenarios can work. Um, 
The interesting thing, oh, and by the way, I should point out, and some of you may all uh, not only know this but practice this, is that a lot of groups with rescue of puppy mill dogs won't adopt them to houses that don't have other dogs. Um, And that's why, or I'm sorry, the reason for that is that this has become so powerful as a tool to help them overcome it. We used to, years ago, think the best place for these dogs was a quiet, non-dog, maybe a couple or something, and we found out that's not the worst, but it's not good. It does not bring them along nearly as fast as having other dogs. Now, some of the people specified some details about the other dog, so I collected them together. Um, on, the, on the left half there is just simply the people that said other dogs. But on the other uh, half, um, you can see there that socialized, outgoing, friendly, happy, gentle, calm, well-behaved. I grouped them all together because they're all fairly similar, meaning that the dogs that your the puppy mill dog is going to join has those characteristics. The other one uh, uh, right below that is well-adjusted, kind of similar. Normal, whatever that means, um, that's also uh, meaning that the dog is like a normal dog. Um, but then it gets a little more different, or a little different. Um, the yellow section there is that the other dog, they, the people specifying that, said that it should also be a rescued dog. Okay? Then below that, uh, it should be of a specific sex. That could be either male or female. Some people there in the pink said it should be an older dog. The other people in the purple said it should be a puppy. Um, then there were some in the red there that said it should be another puppy mill dog. Then right below that, it should be a non-puppy mill dog. And then, um, oh, and the brown uh, is just, it should be more than one dog. Um, So there's a lot of people that think different things in that regard um, uh, beyond just other dog. Um, Whether all of them are right or wrong, that's what we don't know yet. And, of course, it depends on the individual dog since they're all very individual. Um, But it is kind of interesting. And I'll get back to one point there in just a second. So how might the company of other dogs help? Well, there's three ways that I can think of. One is the one that people suggested in their own comments, and that is that the dogs, the normal dogs, are uh, that they learn from them and that they're a good role model. And so what happens is they will see repeatedly, over and over, the interaction of the dog already there with the owner is not a fearful situation. This dog never gets scared when this owner walks in, and so it looks like that dog perceives the non-threat to then come along faster than they would under their own uh, power. The other thing is that when there's the, the, just the owner and the puppy mill dog, there's that one-on-one intensity that's very often uncomfortable. Now, if you remember back to elementary school and you're, you're sitting there um, uh, in a group of people and the, uh, the teacher's asking a question, there's a lot of comfort to the fact that there's 29 other people that she could pick on and not just you. But if they all walked out and it's you and the teacher, all of a sudden it's not a very comfortable situation. And that's what it is for the puppy mill dogs too, is that intensity is not always desired because, as we already know, they aren't into the huggy-lovey type of stuff, um, at least yet. It it takes some time for them. So that one-on-one intensity is completely diffused when the adoptive owner has their, direct, or has their attention directed to all the dogs, not just the puppy mill dog. And then the last one is one that I think is really important, although I've never heard anybody else discuss it, and that is that when you have, as an adopter, when you have the other dogs that satisfy all your needs for dog loviness and all that kind of a thing, then anything that that puppy mill dog does or doesn't do that you aren't all that thrilled with is no big deal, meaning that if that puppy mill dog will not let you touch him and you have three other dogs that you can touch all you want, you could wait it out forever. You could say, that's not, I'm going to give him all the time. It's not a big deal. But when that's your only dog and the dog continually rejects your approaches, that's not easy to live with. No matter how much you counsel the people, it's not an easy thing to live with. So what I think is happening, and you could easily design a study to, to determine this, is that I think that people that hold on and make a more successful adoption 
do often much more when they have other dogs because that failure type of thing isn't kicking in. So I think that having other dogs works in many different ways, um, and whether any of those are right, all of them are right, or none of them are right, um, the bottom line is other dogs are a good thing. Um, oh, but uh, here's one comment uh, from one of the... Uh, 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 participants in the study who brings up a, a, an important point, and that is taking him to church with me by himself so he didn't have the other dogs to rely on. This is a tough thing because when the dogs have others to kind of hide behind, um, it can hamper their improvement. And that's why it's a little surprising on the previous slide for people to say that it should be another puppy mill dog because that's not, by our consideration, a good thing. When you allow them both to cower in their fear and see each other respond to people fearfully over and over, there's really no impetus to overcome that or to allow it to lessen. So the point is, is that when this lady here takes her dogs on trips, she does it alone so that the dog does have to come a little bit out of that, uh, that retreat that a lot of dogs will use their fellow dogs uh, to help them with. Okay. Now, this uh, is kind of a no-brainer, and that is love, affection, and TLC. Unconditional love, constant effusive love from both of us, loving her, telling her I love her and will never hurt her, and she'll never let anyone, uh, I'll never let anyone hurt her again, giving her affection when she asked for it rather than when I wanted to. However, and you could probably predict this, here's another comment that encapsulates the bit of a problem. Baby talk or trying to soothe him when he's scared absolutely does not help. He cannot be comforted by humans. Many potential adopters have been certain that all Smokey needed was someone to love him, thinking that if he saw how quiet and warm they could be, he would come around. But he doesn't see people as a source of safety, so that only backfired on them. If he was scared of strangers, his eyes would be on me to see how I would intervene and protect him. But even then, he didn't want me to touch him. So the cautionary note with all this love and TLC is what I've already touched on here, and that is that they're not all that happy to get it. It's a foreign thing to them, and so loving them to death is scary for a lot of them. So you have to be careful that even though you think love, affection, TLC is a no-brainer, which I think it is, the problem is delivering it. You're delivering it to a dog that very often has a brain wiring that isn't going to receive it like a, like a normal dog. Okay, another one that's fairly uh, uh, commonsensical, and that is uh, speak softly, move uh, slowly. Um, quiet, soft-spoken approach, soothing talk. I also would read aloud the book I was reading at the time while sitting on the floor near her so she'd get used to the sound of my voice. I talked to her in a happy, cheerful tone, keep a calm demeanor, provide a relatively quiet, calm, and stable environment. We moved in a very confident, predictable manner at all times around him, somewhat slower than normal. And this all relates to the fact that, as I showed you before, these dogs are very much... um, on a hair trigger in terms of anxiety and nerves, the way a PTSD soldier is coming back from warfare, um, and that is little sounds and everything can be just tremendously traumatizing. So trying to ease that, as I said, is um, fairly commonsensical. Now, here's where it gets a little more complicated. Petting, touching, and holding. These are the comments from these people. Holding him helped him more than anything else. Constant petting, rubbing, kissing, hugging. Touching, pick up gently and hold on lap, petting, etc. Lots of touching. Tea touch. We practiced hug therapy every day. I'd wrap her in a towel and hold her for a long time while sitting quietly. Many, many hours of holding, cuddling, and walking the house with her in my arms just to see that I would never, ever hurt her. Because of all that holding and squeezing, she now just loves being held tight. Now, the problem with this is going to come in the next set of slides, um, because although for these people they regard this as the most effective, we're going to see that it. Uh, uh, when I ask what's the least effective, a lot of people answer the same thing. Regular routine, consistency, repetition, being on a very set schedule that Callie can depend on, being very consistent, food bowl in exactly the same place, consistent mealtimes, bedtimes, routines, having a regular routine, she learned what to expect, and I think that helped her get over her fears. Socializing. 
Take her with me shopping, errands, meetings, etc., to expose her to as many nice people as I can. Go to the dog park, taking her for walks with other humans and introducing her to new sounds and smells. Carrying him around in a pouch to help him get used to humans and letting strangers hold him. Now, this is another one that I want you to keep in mind because we're going to come back to it in a not as positive uh, aspect. Training and behaviorist type of things, classroom style dog obedience training, obedience classes and agility, positive reinforcement training, counter conditioning, desensitization, home training with a professional and a behavior specialist. All of these people felt that was the most effective thing. Attention to spending time with, and this is not quite the same as affection, but of course they overlap. Regular personal attention time, one-on-one attention, paying attention in a loving way, giving the dog attention, both physical and mental, and when she comes for attention, we always give it to her. Praise, lots of verbal praise, frequent soft praise. We constantly praised any little things she did, encouraged her to be brave in the very scary world. Acceptance and understanding, unconditional acceptance, and we'll come back to that. Um, you have to put yourself in their shoes and try to understand how terrified and confused they, they must be. Now, this is really important. I'm, I'm a little troubled that this scored so low, but maybe people just didn't think of it, and that is that these dogs are very different and look at everything we do and the environment surrounding them as so different I tried, um, there was one day I said, okay, i got to put this down into some kind of written words to pe- where people really understand. So this is what I came up with. I want you all to go through this imaginary thing with me. Just clear your minds for a second, and I'm going to read this to you. Imagine you and your neighbors are enjoying a backyard cookout. Suddenly everyone spots a 40-foot, fall, 40-foot tall creature that looks like an alien from the movie Alien, As the terrified people run in all directions, the creature uses its tentacle-like appendages to snatch you. You're carried away and taken into a monstrous cave-like place that's filled with bizarre machines, tools, furniture, and has dozens of these massively tall aliens all emitting noises that sound like a combination of gargling and screeching. You're overcome by the most intense terror you've ever known, and you begin screaming wildly for your friends to come save you, even though you have no idea if they're anywhere nearby." You're placed in a small, clear, and very cold box. After a few minutes, one of the aliens approaches you, and when it is horrifyingly close, it begins to emit bizarre noises directed right at you. Then two slime-covered claw-like appendages begin to emerge from what resembles eyes of this hideous creature and extend slowly toward you. You're trembling uncontrollably from unimaginable terror as these claws, each about five feet long and easily able to snip your head off like the scissors would snip off a flower from its stem, poke, prod, and pinch you all over your body. Then both claws position themselves around your neck, and as your light flashes before your eyes, the creature's head leans over you, begins to ooze a putrid yellow-brown goo that falls down on your head and nearly suffocates you as it covers your head and body. Have you figured out yet that these aliens are friendly and they're just trying to comfort you and that this will continue until they've socialized you to feel comfortable living with them? That's what the puppy mill dogs are going through. Okay, next, walks. Taking her for a walk was beneficial. Walking and hiking, forcing her to go for walks even though she didn't like it at first, Now she loves her walks. This gets into this forcing thing that we're going to talk about more. Treats and allowing to sleep with us, those are non, don't need to explain those. Safe haven and a safe place. Allowing her to select a safe place, which was a crate with the door open, and never allowing her to be disturbed while in her safe place. Has a bed that's hidden in each room so she has a safe spot. Now this for the mental well-being of any animal, including humans, is probably the single most important thing we can have, and that is a place we can go or something we can do that can shut off the unpleasantness. That's what makes life livable, because anytime you're in a situation where you have no control and ability to turn off the bad things, that's when life gets incredibly distressing. So in this case, these people thought that was the best, but... Allowing a fearful dog, and this is true for fearful people too, 
um, to always be able to retreat and hide can hamper recovery. There's got to be a component that actually edges somebody beyond their fears. Otherwise, they always retreat to that safe place and can never overcome them. That's why with uh, treatment of PTSD in people, the most important, or I'm sorry, the most uh, used therapy is called PE therapy, prolonged exposure, where they are put in a safe environment exposed to the fearful stimulus so that they can come to adapt to it. But it takes them out of their comfort zone, which has to be done. So that means, uh, of course, that the next one, pushing her beyond her comfort zone, is actually something that you need to do. I could not let her hide from her fears. If I had uh, let her hide and not face the world, we couldn't have come this far. Pushing her just a tad beyond her comfort zone to show her scary can lead to good things. Slowly pushing her outside of her comfort zone, for example, putting a leash on her, making her stay in the living room when we turned on the TV. Sometimes I would force myself on him, would pick him up and whisper in his ear while caressing him, but as soon as I'd put him back down, he'd run. Little by little, his fear of me subsided. To get Luke to come out of the bathroom, I tied him to the coffee table in my living room to force him to interact with us. This worked like a charm, and he never went back to the bathroom. Now, of course, the problem here is this. Pushing and not pushing are exact opposites. And so the question arises, and we'll address that, um, is what do you do um, when you've got those two things opposing each other when they both can be good and they both can be bad? Treat like a normal dog, no babying or pitying. The best thing I ever did for Snoopy was treat him as if he had already been norm, as if he was already normal. I treated her just like my other dogs. I did not pity her or overindulge her act as normal as possible around her, even though certain things scared or startled her, did not baby her. And then setting boundaries um, was helpful for just a few of the people. Okay, so that all seems fairly straightforward, except for the things I told you. Oh, I forgot I put this in. I noticed something very interesting when I was reading through these extensive commentaries, and that is this. I picked out some things that looked awful similar Breakthrough, breakthrough similar, seemingly associated with illness or injury. Unfortunately, due to her broken legs, Sadie was forced into becoming more social and trusting. I tried so hard to be patient with Sheba to get her to trust me. Nothing worked. Sheba was at one point very sick and almost died. During this time, she had to be hand-fed and given water by hand to drink. When she got better and back on her feet, she remembered this was the human that helped me, and as a result, she became more trusting and affectionate. The change was noticed after her accident. She became more sociable after her leg broke. She had surgery for a torn cruciate ligament. I had close contact with her for a recovery period, which helped with trust. By the way, this isn't all the same she. That would be a disaster. Okay. So, oh, and then one last thing. Um, uh, It has been, this is another comment. It's been trial and error. One of our friends who loves animals as much as we do said Mitzi, has been getting some has been somewhat of an experiment. You just have to keep trying new things. That is a take home message um, that we'll come back to. Um, but there are a lot of things involved with helping these dogs that become inventive, um, and it's partly because different things help the different dogs. Okay, the next question was the obvious of all the things you've done. What was the least helpful and or least effective? Um, Here's the number one answer. I can't think of anything. And just the comments. I can't think of anything. It seems like every little thing helped move her along. I can't think of anything that was not helpful. Any any acknowledgement of him, no matter how small, seemed to help, even when we had to give, give him his own space. I think all I've done with him has helped. I don't think anything, I don't think I did anything that did not help. And I think everything, uh, every, everything thing, Everything she has experienced has helped her take baby steps forward. Okay. But what did they do then? Well, these are the things that scored uh, as important, non-effective things. First one is using harsh voices. Scolding, stern discipline, yelling or raising your voice, punishment of any sort, any negativity toward her, absolutely cannot be yelled at or have any physical punishment. Yelling at her just sets her back and upsets her. The couple of times I've raised my voice, I've immediately regretted it because it's so devastating to her. Once she was bringing in poo from the outside and I told her no in a firm but calm voice and gently shook my index finger at her. It frightened her 
Uh, It frightened her, and she became scared. She ran up the stairs to the bed and curled up in a little ball. Initially, I did give him a timeout for going to the bathroom in the house. The look on his little face haunts me. It wasn't his fault that he couldn't get it right away. I might have yelled at him in frustration. I don't think I did this more than once or twice, but I regret it because he did backslide. So harsh voices, and I mentioned that um, with Boomer earlier, that um, uh, any effort to uh, 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 housebreak him um, with a loud voice or anything would just upset him, um, and, um, and loud voices are incredibly uh, traumatic for them. Okay, now remember I asked you to think of a few things that were on the list of most effective. This is one that was on the most effective list of taking the dog to uh, dog parks and, and, uh, uh, and grocery stores and things like that. Here are the people that put this as the least effective. Bringing Tinky out in public to try to desensitize her to strangers in new places really doesn't seem to have helped her. Trying to socialize her too soon with other people. I have taken her to PetSmart or the dog park or to friends' houses to socialize her, but she's still afraid of people and other dogs. I would constantly try to socialize her, taking her on walks in crowded areas. It did not help her fear. I felt it would show her no harm would come to her, but it just made her anxious. Trying to get her to accept other people by handing her to them so she would see they won't hurt her, it did not help and even made her more fearful and paranoid. Upon the advice of an animal behaviorist, sitting at Walmart on a bench with her on a Saturday afternoon for an hour to get her to use the noises and people coming up to her to pet her, stupidest thing I've ever done. He has become my travel partner in the car on long trips, and it has helped him adjust to new situations, but not to new people. So this is one of the difficult things, um, and, and we'll come back to how these clash, um, but um, the point is, is that it is the most effective for some and the least effective for others. Pushing and forcing him to do something, this is kind of something you'd figure out from what we've covered already. Least helpful was forcing him to do things he was just not ready to do, like going to the dog park and expecting him to behave. How scary that must have been and how stupid of me to keep trying it. Forcing her to do something that was beyond her comfort zone. Trying to force a certain behavior on them doesn't work at all. Now, this, of course, is in direct conflict with the people that think pushing them beyond their comfort zone is, was the most helpful thing, um, and um, we'll talk more about that. Oh, was told by rescue to flood him with attention. That was a mistake. By allowing him to just be himself, give him the opportunity to just watch the world around him and have him come to us on his own time when he was ready. Trying to get her to face her fears, which is um, the recommendation by a certain... Um, Certain, you know, dog whisperer. Um, and um, if any of you saw that, the special show that he put on with Puppy Mill Rescues, um, if you knew a lot about Puppy Mill dogs, you'd be horrified because that was his approach, is face it. And I, was, I just couldn't believe that was happening. Okay, training related. Um, that was the best thing for some people, Here's where it didn't work out as the least effective. Traditional reward-based training initially was not useful as she just, try, just wanted to pretend we didn't exist. Trying to train him as you would a normal dog, it only scares him and makes him nervous. Trying traditional potty training methods, I had to throw out the book on dog behavior when he came to our home. Taking her to obedience classes, she was completely overwhelmed and traumatized by them, so we quit going after five weeks. Obedience training, she had a hard time learning. She tries really hard. She just can't pick up on it. Having a dog trainer come who insisted she mind, believe me, that was not going to happen. She did not want to down. He came twice and never again. Normal clicker training didn't work as the clicker sound was too startling, even when we dampened the sound. Once again, getting back to the hair trigger nerves that uh, a lot of these dogs uh, live with. All right, using a crate, trying to crate train her. The first, tra- the first night, we put her in a new crate with the pretty pink, pink, pretty pink blanket, gave her water, and shut the door. She proceeded to ram her head into the door repeatedly and wouldn't stop. She didn't bark or make a noise. She just kept ramming her head. Trying to put her in her crate for her own safety, she flipped out. Crating her was a disaster, but least effective. Again, this is people talking. Least effective was allowing her to be free to be free range in the house when I went out, not crating her. 
So it's just the opposite. I think giving her full run of the house when I first got her was very confusing for her. She chewed up a lot of stuff and marked everywhere. I think I, 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 I then got a large wire crate with blankets that I kept her, her in the living room when I'm at work. She totally calmed down after that. So crates work the opposite on certain dogs. Petting, touching, and holding. Remember I told you that, to remember that one because that's what a lot of people said. Hug therapy and tea touch and all that was the most effective. Here's the other end of that, um, or the other side of that. Tried petting him every day to help him get used to it, but it seemed to have no effect, positive or negative. I tried holding her frequently at the beginning, but uh, that just made her hide better. Trying to desensitize her to noises, being handled and touched. We worked with a professional trainer, and it was awful for her. Was told by rescue to pick him up multiple times a day, try to pet him, shower him with affection, etc. Wrong, wrong, wrong. We were advised to hold her until she relaxed as therapy for her. Every time I did it, I felt like I was torturing her, so I stopped. We've had to realize that loving her is not enough. She needs a lot of time to learn she can trust us. So we already know from the study that touch sensitivity and hug and hold and these dogs is much higher in these dogs than uh, normal dogs, and it seems to be true for hoarded dogs too. Um, but in this case, like I said, we've got the flip-flop of it being best and least effective. Leashing, I've tried to train him to walk on a leash, but he's absolutely terrified of leashes. We were told to keep her on a leash to catch her, and we realized quickly that she was traumatized by that and stopped it after a month, teaching her hand commands patiently instead worked just fine. Play. Trying to teach Blaine how to play has not worked. We tried to play with her, never going to happen. She doesn't know what toys are. Trying to get her to play with toys, she just doesn't understand the throw and fetch a toy concept, and I don't think she ever will. Uh, Not setting boundaries. Okay, this is an important one. A lot of people put um, that the one thing that they did that they regret or that didn't work or whatever is reinforcing the fear. Um, and this, uh, I put a few comments. Coddling her fear was not effective. Soothing her when she was scared. Rewarding their fear. Reinforcing her scared behavior by petting her and, and comforting her when she was freezing up. A lot of the people that put these things would also put some kind of comment like, I know it was wrong. I shouldn't have done it. That's all bunk. I hope you all know this now, that this is the worst advice to not comfort their fear because you're going to reinforce it. You cannot reinforce the emotional response. You can reinforce the behavior, but that's very different. If you could reinforce the emotional response, you could also punish it away, and we can't do that either. And the, the, the easiest way to look at this is imagine you're a mother with a child who's five years old. You're taking an airplane ride, um, and all of a sudden it's his first ride, and um, uh, the plane gets thrown around by wild turbulence, and your son goes absolutely ballistic in terms of fear. How many here, you don't have to answer, how many here would say, I'm not going to say anything to him because that's just going to reinforce his fear? Nobody. I mean, it's the most ridiculous concept, and it got, it, it got a lot of play in veterinary medicine and behavior for a long time. Um, but it's complete bunk. So please, please don't think that a dog that's um, uh, thunderstorm phobic or whatever is going to be worse when you comfort him. He's going to be the same way that five-year-old is on the airplane. He's going to be possibly comforted, but nothing's going to make it worse. Um, As I said, the behavior can be. That gets into this bizarre thing of sympathy lameness, um, which used to be a big concept that you'd reward the limp and then they'd keep limping. Um, but, um, but anyway, so just be aware. Comforting an animal that's scared is not going to make them more scared. Okay. Um, all right. And then the other ones that don't need uh, really much ex- explanation, having impatience, that's obvious. That's not going to work. Uh, and now some people, but it was only like two people, said that another dog um, was not helpful. Um, feeling sorry for him, not helpful. And then uh, one person said letting him sleep with me was not helpful. Okay. All right. The next question after that, which in my mind was quite different, people kind of looked at these two as similar. Um, did anything that uh, did anything happen, or or that you did, make your dog have a setback, different than least effective? But people, like I said, kind of mixed the two together. 
And this is what we got back for that. 206 people uh, gave us an answer for a setback. Number one, a scary event of some kind. Typically, it's an incident that scared her. Sometimes the setback lasts only a couple hours. Sometimes it lasts several days. Sooner or later, we get past it and start moving forward again. There was a three-year-old boy with a hose who squirted Megan right in the face. At this point, she regressed quite a bit, and it took her about a month to move forward. I took Jazzy to the groomer and left him uh, and left him and my other pup there most of the day until they were done. Wrong thing to do. He was very upset when I picked him up, wouldn't eat, was shaking, and had stomach problems too. The groomers come to the house now, and it's fine. On vacation, we stopped in Daytona during bike week. The noise of the motorcycles terrified Gizmo. We left immediately, but I'm afraid it was a setback. One trainer pinned him to, pinned him to cut his nails. He flailed, cried, and just kept... Uh, just kept full eye contact with me. After this, it took him a few days to trust again. She accidentally ran into a sliding glass door and was then even more afraid of loud noises. So a scary event is the biggest setback uh, that people uh, were seeing uh, by far, actually. Being forced and pushed, I already talked about that in the, in the way they answered the least effective question, um, and that is that pushing them caused them uh, to either not improve or actually get worse. Here's another one that showed up uh, a number of times, and that is a vacation or or the attached human away in some other way. When we first boarded him, he he was distant towards us for a period of time. I had him a year and a half when I went on vacation for a week and left him with the foster family. He regressed a lot from what they described. I am his lead dog, and he is lost without me. I was away for an extended time, and her progress took a few steps back without my consistent work with her. So... Your absence or your adopter's absence um, can cause a setback. Raise voice scold, already told you that in the uh, answer to the previous one. Move and change in household was another one that showed up a number of times. I was forced to sell my house and move. The stress of moving was very difficult on her, as well as the other mill dogs. It set us back on housebreaking, and I saw much more anxiety. All of Bo's setbacks were a result of his being moved around. Each placement set him back to square one. Letting her, to get, letting her get adjusted at my house, then shipping her off to another foster home. Big mistake. Change in routine. Um, not a lot of detail on that one, just things that, weren't, or that were disruptive. Medical and surgical. His crate confinement after surgery really set him back. He was just getting used to being a real dog and then had to be put in a crate for his recovery. He's, uh, he has made great strides since then. Cleaning her ears twice a day because of an ear infection, her reaction was to hide more and for a longer time. Trip to the vet, obvious no animals want to come to see us. Uh, Loss of a companion. Death of her leader dog, December 09, uh, uh, regressed, seemed clinically depressed. There was a definite setback when we lost Isabella. Mandy was devastated. When the fosters are adopted, she does not understand what happens to them. They suddenly go in the car and never come back. New person or pet, use of crate, training related. Having Caesar Milan work with her for 30 minutes on a walk with me, um, her previous owner was a man that wore a ball cap. To this day, she fears ball caps on, on a man. That will never go away, in my opinion. That was a setback for her. I paid an experienced dog trainer to come to the house in the month after I adopted Sally to give me some tips for how to establish our alpha-beta relationship. She told me to pick up Sally, flip her over on her back, and hold her in my lap like a baby until she stopped squirming and relaxed. She hated it, and it seemed to make her more afraid of me. No surprise there. Uh, Change in routine. Um, Okay, so... Oh, one last thing is some people uh, describe the obvious, and that is, uh, here's one comment, nothing we can figure happens. She'll just sometimes go back to being more timid and shaking. So there's uh, sometimes setbacks that don't have an apparent cause in the the recovery of these dogs. Okay, so what the, some dogs, some things help the dogs, some things don't help them, some things can hurt them, and some things can help and hurt them. So how do I know what to do? Well, to answer that question, here's what I did. I took the list of most effective, and then I color-coded this 
to where the ones that are in green are the ones that all but the rarest exceptions are all positive, meaning that if you give advice to owners or if you yourself are adopting a dog, these are the things that you can safely undertake and know that they're going to be good or at least neutral. The yellow ones are the ones that might be good but might also be detrimental. And so what you need to do with the yellow ones is if you're using them and you see any problems, abandon immediately and don't use those because for your individual dog, that's not a workable solution. And this is a difficult thing to put into a completely practical piece of advice, which I'll give you next uh, talk. Um, but, um, uh, but the point is, is that all these animals, as you all well know, are very individual, and so this is the most systematic approach to using what we now know is effective and ineffective, and for that matter, uh, even harmful. Okay, rehabilitative therapy for hoarded animals. There's not a lot to say here because we just don't have the data yet. Um, I should have the same type of data that I just ran through, puppy mill rescue helping and hurting, um, uh, but unfortunately not for a while. So um, the question, uh, to date, animals recovered from hoarding situations have been medically and behaviorally cared for as individuals no different than any other animals with similar afflictions. Is this the best approach? Does it matter if, if when treating excessive fear in dogs, the history of the dog being from a hoarding situation is known or not? Would, or more importantly, should the therapeutic decisions differ between a human fearful dog from a hoarding situation and a human fearful dog with no history of hoarding? These are questions that we don't yet have answered. We have, as you just saw, better answers now for puppy mill rescues, uh, but the hoarding answers are still pretty much a hodgepodge of everybody takes care of their own hoarding rescues um, in their own what they feel are the best ways. And until it all settles out, um, just like so many things in animal welfare care, um, everybody does their own thing. And then, of course, the big question is, what about cats, rabbits, parrots, horses, farm animals, rats? Of course, they're cool. Um, And other species... um, What about the treatment of them after they come out of hoarding? Because all of them have problems too, um, and we just don't have good answers uh, yet. Um, At least different than, again, treating them as a behavioral case in and of themselves of being either human fearful uh, or shy of one thing or another. So um, we just don't have specific therapies uh, the way we want them uh, quite yet.